Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Erie number 115, which uh, collects the 1975 serial that ran in, in Erie called Night of the Jackass. Um, this is an October 1980 issue. Uh, I bought this when I was 13, right off the stands. And this was almost like getting a mini graphic novel. It was because uh, it's four chapters of Night of the Jackass collected, you know, five years after they came out. I never read the original printings. So this blew my mind. At the time, I was reading Micronauts and Shogun Warriors and Marvel Team Up. And, uh, you know, Erie was one of the the Warren Magazine uh, titles, anthology and every now and then I'd pick one up as a kid, and they really were, like, almost like comics for adults. I mean, not the most intellectual adult, but the level of writing um, sometimes was like, yeah, a kid wouldn't even like this, you know? This is definitely not for kids. So um, I was very happily surprised reading rereading this last night for the first time in, like, I don't know, 30 years. But the writing is really good, especially considering it was written in 1975. There weren't many good writers in comics at the time. I mean, you had like Gerber, Engelhart, and McGregor. But I don't know. They still a lot of cheesiness in their writing because they had to write for the Comic Code Authority and had to write for, you know, their Marvel editors and DC editors. But uh, this is some good stuff. The cover is by Jim Laurier. Laurier? He uh, did a bunch of worn covers. I never saw him anywhere else, though. I think he's English. Pretty nice stuff. Very typical worn cover. Contents page. We see the four chapters of uh, Night of the Jackass. And then there's a bonus story. I guess they had to fill out the issue. And uh, the only connection between it and the Night of the Jackass is the same artist, Jose Ortiz. The whole this whole issue is drawn by Jose Ortiz, which is really nice because he's great. Jose Ortiz is that great Spanish artist. I think he started like being published in the late forties, and he was in so many different markets. He drew for the English market forever. I think he drew for the Italian market later on in his life, doing westerns. But he came to prominence in Warren magazines and drew ton hundreds of pages for Eerie and Creepy. The writer slash creator of Night of the Jackass is this guy I'd never really heard of, Bruce Bazaar. He was only writing comics for like three years, from like 73 to 76, mostly for Warren. And, um, I mean, he was quite popular. Um, Night of the Jackass was a very popular serial in the Erie. That's why it was collected in this uh, issue. Bruce Bazaar just disappeared out of the comics world in 76, and apparently he got born again. And uh, he just didn't think that writing comics for Warren Comics, Warren Publishing was uh, <laughs> compatible with his new lifestyle as a Christian. So he, I think he did some Christian comics years later, but it was kind of sad because he had a promising career. Because this is pretty well written. This is some nice stuff. So we start off here, it's Victorian London, and uh, we see this hotel. We see this guy Garson with his new bride, he's very happy, they're on their honeymoon. And then we meet this other guy, uh, his name is Bishop, Claude Bishop. He's not very happy, in fact, he kind of booked the room at the, the top of this hotel because he's contemplating suicide. And he's actually thinking about jumping off out of the window any minute. The first chapter is called 24 Hours of Hell. So all of a sudden, this like kind of a motley crew of derelicts, old men, old winos, uh, come to the hotel. The um, Bishop notices from the top window, he's like, What's going on? They, our building's been closed off below. No one coming out. Those outside running away. 
And the old men, once they're inside and they barricaded the door, they slash their wrists and put this powder in it. And all of a sudden they're transformed into, into the um, these monstrous creatures with the strength of 10 men and no morality or ethics to speak of. They're pure id. And they just start raping and murdering everyone in the hotel. Savagely with no remorse. So uh, Bishop is on the top floor, like we said, and he hears the shots. When he runs out of his room, he meets Garson. And all these other people on the top floor are all concerned, like, what's going on? And it turns out it's a jackassing. So this is, I guess this has been going on for months. Every couple of weeks, uh, a bunch of guys will barricade some place and take this drug, high 25, and for 24 hours, they'll, you know, like I said, have the strength of 10 men, do whatever the fuck they want, um, lash out at the society that kept them so down, and then they'll die. It's basically, you have 24 hours to live once you take it. You just burn yourself out like a fuse. So it's, it's definitely, there's a huge social critique underpinning this uh, series where showing how miserable the lives were of the poor in Victorian England, where this drug is spreading like wildfire. Everyone knows it will kill you and they don't care. They're like, oh, for 24 hours to get to just be like a, you know, strong and get revenge on everyone who ever hurt me and it's uh, kind of nasty, kind of sad to think about that these people are that desperate. They're just like, what the hell? So these guys are trying to think of a plan. They're going to barricade the staircase. And uh, Bishop, all of a sudden, is surprised himself to find that he, he was just going to kill himself five minutes before. But now he's all rallying the crowd and... Uh, He's basically he's basically thinking to himself, I'll be damned if I'm gonna let these jackassers, you know, kill me, kill us all. So it kind of sparks him to life, back to life. So uh Bishop and Garson, they go down to floor to like just check out, do some recon, and they see a jackasser and they they kill it. They throw a lamp at its head. And the other jackassers, another jackasser comes up and they make it to the top floor. They barricade the staircase. <clears throat> and pretty soon the whole, the mass of jackassers comes up to the barricade. It, they make short work of it. They're obviously going to break through and they just start attacking. But they're fighting back. They're, everyone's uh, not just laying down to die. But they're so strong that they're totally losing. Man, Jose Ortiz is just such a master of his craft. Just the ink work in this. It just looks so good. And the way the storytelling just flows... I guess at this point he had already been drawing comics for like 30 years or something. So Garson sends his wife to the roof. But I guess she got ahead, too far ahead, and this jackasser was up there and killed her. Garson blows him away with a gun. And of course he's just devastated. He's like, my love, my baby. Bishop comes up, and uh, we realize they're two very different people. Bishop is just like, you know, I got the hell out of there. I'm not gonna, I, I can't save every woman and man down there. They're all dead. And Garson is kind of chastising. Was you didn't even try to save the women? It's like, nope, I didn't. And there's two more jackassers left. 
and up on the roof, they start this big uh, ruckus. They start this fight. And then later on, they wake up in a hospital. They're uh, bandaged up and beating the crap out of but they're alive. They survived. I guess the um, jackassers uh, fell dead on top of them. The 24-hour limit was up. And this detective's like, you've got quite a lot to look forward to. Quite lucky you are. And of course, Garson is just crying because he doesn't care. He lost his wife. Now we see chapter two, Storm Before the Calm. And there's another jackassing. There's a few weeks after the first story. It's in a church, a, a cathedral. There's a, a bunch of crowd of rubberneckers shows up just to look and see what's going on. But also in the crowd are Bishop and Garson, and they get reacquainted. And they both kind of came for the same reason. They're just like, it's almost like they got a, they got the whiff of jackassers and they want to get more of them. They, they want to hunt them down. This detective there basically let, tells the guys that, yeah, our policy is just we surround the place, wait till everyone burns out and dies, and then we clean it up. Because we're not going to risk 20 detectives, 20 bobbies, storming this place full of uh, jackassers. They're too strong. And Garson and uh, Bishop are kind of disgusted. They're just like, oh, man. So our cops aren't going to protect us. I guess we're gonna, it's up to us. So that they look at each other to formulate a plan. We look inside the cathedral. It's hell on earth in there. They're just torturing and raping and murdering. But man, so beautifully drawn. So here we see uh, Bishop and Garson planning how to get into the church. We see the pastor. They've uh, nailed him to the cross. I like this. It says, as the cross does the job it was originally designed for. Thaddeus Morgan draws near to death. And in his head, he's beseeching God to send like an archangel to... Uh, do battle with these horrible monsters. So our our dynamic duo uh, sneak into the church. I like this expression on Bishop's face when he sees the carnage. It's just like he can't believe it. Jackassers are kind of dumb. They're not that bright. So they just kind of hang out with the crowd as if they were the parishioners who were there in the first place. It's just two more people. They're not going to notice. They try to help this one woman escape. They say, go crawl all the way to the front door and try to get out. But she gets caught. And they start fighting the jackassers. And they're doing pretty good. So uh, they they didn't rescue everyone, but they rescued a bunch of people, which has never happened before. Almost all jackassings end with like total everyone dying. And there's a bond formed between these two guys. So the detective not only can, doesn't congratulate them, he basically uh, dresses them down. Says, if I ever see you guys near jackassing again, pulling this kind of shit. I'm going to bust you, throw you in jail. So they basically tell the detective, like, we're going to put an end to this drug with or without your help. You paper bound ass. Chapter three, the children's hour. We see these poor orphans. You can imagine how shitty their lives are. You know, 
it was bad enough for adults, but you're an orphan in Victorian England. It's probably like a fucking living hell. So these kids got a, a hold of some high 25. And they don't know how it kills you after 24 hours. They just know it makes you big and strong. And they decide to take it. With the expected result. I like this metamorphosis. So it's another jackassing, this time in the orphanage. And Bishop and Garson show up. And the detective warns them against going in, and they say, fuck you. <coughs> Excuse me. And they sneak in. The kids are just going crazy in there. Getting revenge on all their oppressors like the mean, the mean headmaster. Mr. Catlin had a taste of his own hickory switch. Somebody punched Winch in the nose. And they're just raping the female teachers. It's, it's horrible. As they're sneaking around, they see this woman who, like, she snuck in herself. And her name's Mademoiselle Astruc. And she tells them that she has a cure for high 25. And she came because she wants to try it out and see if it works. And here we really see the difference between Bishop and Garson. You know, Garson is wants to kill these jackasses or end it out of, like, he wants revenge for his wife's death. But with um, Bishop, he's just more of a suicidal guy who just doesn't care about his own life. So he figures he needs some purpose to keep him going, and this is it. He also finds that he's quite hooked on the violence of it, and uh, he digs it. So he doesn't even care about the Zakir. He's just like, that's not why we're here. We've got some monsters to kill. But Garson gets it. Garson's like, no, we want to end this fucking the jackassers. Oh, this is horrible. This poor little kid. And ripped apart by these uh, jackassers. So they're, uh, you know, fighting the jackassers wherever they can. They're, it's almost like they've become really good at killing jackassers, these guys. So uh, one of them jumps on Garson, and Mademoiselle Astruc plunges her hypodermic into his back and it, it in seconds later it turns the the jackasser back into a little boy and you know and he's back to normal so he's saying I'm sorry please forgive me and then he drops over dead from exhaustion So now basically at the end of the story, they've killed all the jackassers and they kind of become a trio. They agree to help each other. Next uh, and final chapter, Endstorm. Once again, the detective's giving them shit about their anti-jackass activities. They're all hanging out at uh, Mademoiselle Astrick's place. And Bishop finds a notebook. And it turns out that Astruck is the creator of High 25. Her and her husband created it. Um, she had to put him down like a dog when he got infected with it. And, you know, she feels so guilty about it. And she's been, that's why she's so uh, driven to find a cure. So it caused a huge rift in the group. Because basically now Garson blames her for killing his wife. Like she invented uh, High 25 and that's why his wife is dead. They kind of like basically kick Bishop out of the group. They're just like, Astra kicks him out of her house. Says, uh, I just, 
you know, I'm done with you. And then like a little while later, they come out of the room and I guess Bishop snuck into the laboratory and there was a sample of high 25 and he took it. So Bishop is now a jackasser. They run from him and lock themselves up in this room. We're well, not yet um, here. The detective's still hanging out with him. Jose Ortiz is so uh, interesting. When you really like slow down to look at his art, it doesn't make sense. Like this looks like such a well-drawn face, right? You just look at it quick, you read it, your, your eyeballs read it as a good face. But when you look closely, there's all these like chicken scratch marks. Look, very, They almost look random, but it totally works. You see more of it here. Very just like, it looks speedy and it looks sloppy, but it works. It's so weird. Like when you're reading the comic, it's like, oh yeah, look at this great face here. But when you look closely, these crazy marks, thinking. So finally, Bishop figures out how to get into the room through the dumbwaiter. And he attacks our heroes. He looks like he's about to kill Garson. And Astruck lures Jackass Bishop over to her. She takes her shirt off and says, Oh, do you want a piece of this, basically? And he does. And she just did that so she could get close enough to him to uh, plunge the hypodermic with the antidote into his back. And this time it works. Not only does it cure him, but it doesn't kill him. And Bishop gains consciousness and apologizes for what he did. And he just tells them reasons why he did it is that his life really is pretty terrible and when they kicked him out of the group he realized he had nothing left so he just said fuck it I'm taking high 25 and he walks out the doors you won't be needing me you got your cure now and that's the end of uh, Night of the Jackass uh, uh, I imagine you know, they're going to spread the drug around, the antidote, and everything would be back to normal soon. Here we have the bonus story. Nothing to do with any of the jackass except for the art is by Jose Ortiz. Excerpts from year five. This is a really good post-apocalyptic story. It's written by Bud Lewis. He did tons of writing for Warren Comics. So I guess five years in the future, um, some sometime soon, Man finally fucks up enough where we go through all of our resources and, you know, we squeeze it out to the last year, the last month, the last week. Finally, it's the last day, right in the middle of winter. Just everything's run out. Oil, any kind of energy. So that first winter, billions, millions or maybe even billions of people die from exposure without... Uh, gas and oil to heat their apartments so there's a few survivors left tons of dead people everywhere we basically have this guy who's our narrator he's the one who explains to us everything that happened in the past you know year or so there's these death crews around who just go around collecting the dead to bury them to get him off the street. And one of them is shoveling babies into the back of a truck. And uh, our narrator's mind snaps. You can't stop thinking about that old joke. What's the difference between a truckload of coal and a truckload of dead babies? He wakes up in a 
camp, like a hospital camp. And this woman is feeding him soup. And over the days and weeks, um, they fall in love with each other. And our narrator basically seemed to have no hope for this world. You know, it changed, he becomes a changed man through his love for her. Her name is Pat. She's this amazing woman. She's a saint. She spends all of her life just taking care of the sick, burying the dead. But now she also has love in her life. And, you know, our narrator joins her in her work and he becomes part of the hospital. We see how Saint like Pat is, is like one day these scavengers attack the hospital. And he goes out to fight him with a shovel. They've got guns and stuff. And Pat yells after him. She says, Ben, don't. You can't just kill someone. And he's like, sorry, honey. These guys are trying to kill us. But that's how sweet she is. You know, she doesn't want anyone to die. She's a total pacifist. So he actually succeeds. And he kills a bunch of the guys with his shovel. And the rest run off in fear. One day, um, they find this little kid trapped beneath the floorboards of a house. And they're trying to coax him out. Ben, uh rips off the floorboards and they go down there. Look at this horrifying vision. This little baby toddler is like at his mother's breast, suckling at her bony breast. Get warm, mommy, get warm. And later on when the when Ben naively says, how did that baby survive for so long trapped under that thing? And she's like, really? <laughs> he ate his mom. So the mom was a nourishing mother, even after her death. So they kind of adopt this little cannibal baby into their lives as they're almost like their own kid. And it seems like it's it's a nice, you know, things are nice. Springs on its way eventually. Everyone's hopeful that uh, things can turn around. Unfortunately, P Pat's saint-like qualities are sometimes a little too saintly. Because this really creepy bunch comes to the the shelter to stay. And Pat doesn't refuse them. Everyone else is like, oh, these guys are creepy. We don't want them here. They're even self-professed Satanists. But she says, my place is welcome to all. And they creep out everyone with, by doing these rituals. And just as everyone feared, one night, they... Uh, they sacrifice the boy that they rescued. They slit him from his belly to his throat. And I guess uh, Pat pushed her over the edge and she blows him all the way with a shotgun. She was never the same again. So right around then, like three weeks later or so, Pat uh, takes ill. And she passes away. She never saw the spring. As he holds her in his arms after she's dead, the only thing he could say was, get warm, mommy, get warm. So he takes her to her favorite spot near a sweet apple cherry. I'm sorry, a sweet apple tree. And he buries her. And that's some bleak stuff. But that's, um, if you remember what I was saying, you know, reading this when you're 13, this kind of shit didn't happen in Marvel Team Up. <laughs> you know, like this incredible, tragic stuff. And uh, it was eye opening. And especially the art, too. I mean, nobody was drawing like this at Marvel DC. And then the end of, uh, we see all of Warren's magazines, Vampirella, 1994, Rook, Creepy, Famous Monsters. In the back of every Warren comic, they would just sell these toys and stuff and various nerdy, uh, geeky things. I guess Close Encounters just came out, so they're pushing lots of Close Encounters and 
That'll start Galactica shit. Look at these original Star Wars figures, two ninety five each. Some of these are worth hundreds of dollars now. Yeah, there's some fun stuff in here that I, I wish I could go back in time with 50 bucks and uh, buy all the good stuff. Back issues of here, I got. I wish I could just buy all these for $3 or something. That's it. Eerie, number 115, Night of the Jackass. Almost kind of like a mini graphic novel. It's a uh, very, I guess, slight for a graphic novel, but uh, it definitely tells a full story. It's definitely meaty. So I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, hope you can find this and read it for yourself. It's it's a good read, and like I said, fucking Jose Ortiz, beautiful art. So thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you here next time at the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies.